panel discussion, Misrepresentation, Women, Girls, Power, and the Media. I'm Carrie Rentschler. I'm director of the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies here at McGill, and I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Arts, History, and Communication Studies. If you don't know, the Institute was formed in 2009, and um, we are an academic unit in the Faculty of Arts that catalyzes, supports, and disseminates interdisciplinary research and teaching in gender, sexual diversity, and feminist studies. <coughs> we also house the teaching programs in women's studies and sexual diversity studies, and organize talks, symposia, and cool events like this one tonight. <laughs> Tonight's event is co-sponsored and co-organized by the Institute and Media at McGill, our colleagues and comrades in the Faculty of Arts. We're delighted to be working together to address our shared interests and concerns about the differential systems of gender, race, class, and sex representation in the media, and the strategies at hand to address them. Tonight's panel gets to the heart of these issues. Our panelists have a wealth of knowledge to share about how to change systems of representation, how to create our own media, and ways we can and already have demanded feminist media justice. Our panelists work in the media. They have created key feminist and alternative media outlets. They set and implement national policy to address problems of misrepresentation and underrepresentation in the media, and they are experienced activists. Basically, they are fantastic. <laughs> I am really excited that they could join us this evening to share their wisdom and critical perspectives on the media. As a scholar of media and social movements, I know the power of collective action. I believe that through better knowledge and education and the tools of feminist media literacy, we can powerfully combine forces to tackle the durable problems of women's and girls' misrepresentation in the media and the racialized, sexist, ableist, ageist, and classist ways in which some girls' and women's lives are made invisible in the media while other women's and girls' lives are made hyper-visible. Our public conversation tonight is meant to stimulate a discussion that we can hope can continue long after this evening and we at the Institute look forward to being part of that larger dialogue. Tonight's event capstones a day-long series of free screenings we've offered of the 2011 film Misrepresentation by filmmaker Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Tonight's conversation is based in part on the film and the issues it raises, but you needn't have seen it to fully participate here tonight. Our goal in organizing this event was to use the film to open up a conversation, and we believe that it's the conversations we have on the issues and the strategies we develop to address them that matters the most. I encourage those of you who are not able to attend one of the debut screenings today to stay tuned for other screenings of the film that will be happening on campus and around Montreal. I've talked to several student groups who have plans of showing it this term as well, I think with the Vagina Monologues, and I've also heard from Cinema Politica that they have some plans to do that as well. So keep your eyes out for more information on that if you're interested. I want to thank you, our great volunteers from today and this evening, our co-sponsors at Mediate McGill, and our amazing panelists for joining us tonight. After the panel concludes, I hope you'll stick around for a reception that's going to be held just outside in the foyer. I want to turn it over to my colleague, Mark Raboy, who runs Media at McGill, and he will introduce our moderator for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, as Kerry mentioned, this event is a collaboration between the Institute and Media at McGill. Media at McGill is a unit for research, scholarship, and public outreach on issues and controversies at the interface of media, technology, and culture. Now that's a mouthful, but I think it describes and characterizes very well the topic that we're going to deal with tonight. Uh, representation is so important, and this is such a fabulous topic, and actually, um, I don't recall whose idea it was initially, but it was so obvious to do this. Um, um, as, as soon as we thought of it. Um, representation is important in at least two senses. I mean, it's about portrayal, as uh, we're going to hear about, and as you, you uh, saw, those of you who had the opportunity to see the, 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 the film, it's also about uh, who is present in the making of media. And I think that is so important, and that's another aspect that um, often gets 
left aside in this discussion. I mean, who is there where and when decisions are being made about portrayal? And um, I'm sure, I have no doubt that we're going to be hearing about this from uh, the panelists tonight. Um, this is such a wonderful panel. It really is an A panel. I have to say, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to. <laughs> um, you know, we, we do a lot of events, and we're so delighted that we really had, we really got our top picks for this panel. And Lagasse Dels and Francine Peltier, Martine Ballet. And um, in a moment, our moderator, Judy Revick, will present them properly. Um, but let me say a few words about Judy. There's no better result. <laughs> Judy Rebick has rightly held the titles of journalist, activist, and academic in an extensive and diverse career. She came to national prominence as president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women in the early 1990s. Uh, a little bit later, she hosted two national programs on the CBC, Face Off, a primetime debating show, and Straight from the Hip, a women's discussion show. Uh, she's also uh, the founder and initial publisher of an independent news website, Rabble.ca. And if any of you don't know Rabble.ca, go there immediately. We take out your iPhones and go to Rabble.ca um, as you tweet from this event. Uh, Judy has given her support to a, a wide range of social movements, feminists and grassroots movements, <coughs> most recently the Occupy Social Movement. From 2002 to 2010, she held the Sam Gindon Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson University. And she is currently the Eakin Fellow at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, where this semester she is lecturing on women's movements in Canada. And she is the author of several books, including Transforming Power from the Personal to the Political and 10,000 Roses, The Making of a Feminist Revolution. Uh, she has a new ebook called Occupy This, which will be published by Penguin on March 15th. And she is currently working on a memoir of life in the 60s, which begins with her period as a student at McGill. Shall I say how long I've known yeah, Judy? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Judy for at, at least 45 years. I mean, we were together on the McGill Daily in the um, mid-1960s. Um, Judy knows a lot. I've learned a lot from Judy. Um, she knows a lot about media representation of women. She knows a lot about so many things. Um, I just can't say enough about her, so maybe I'll just stop. Thanks. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Mark and I worked on the McGill Daily together. We made a lot of good trouble, like people are doing now again, which is great. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the evening a bit. First, I want to say that um, I don't lecture. I, have, I run a seminar on second wave feminism, uh, and it's uh, so I don't lecture at all. I, I try not to lecture ever, but I don't even have the pretense of a lecture in this class because it's a seminar, and, and it's great. It's really, I've really been enjoying it. Um, the second thing I want to say is that, oddly enough, women's representation in the media has never really been my issue. Um, I, I've had many feminist issues that I focused on, from <coughs> pro-choice, uh, racism, diversity in the women's movement, and so on. And even though I worked in the media for a long time now, um, and was an advocate trying to get media, and then worked on television, or I worked in pretty well every media now, um, I, it's never been my focus, and uh, maybe I can think about why that is in the course of the discussion. Um, but, uh, so, so I just wanted to say that, but of course I've thought about it a lot, and um, you know, I worked on television, and the impact of that on me and, as a woman, and, and, and the first time, I, the only time in my life I've ever been vain was after I worked on TV for a few years. Like, I, I did a story of, um, I was the left wing, uh, host of a, of a left-right debate show called Face Off. And this is when uh, people like Tony Clement were just getting started. I tried to smash him and squish him, but it didn't work. And Ezra Levant, too. Um, anyway, 
Ed, people don't know Ezra Levant. That's good. Who knows Ezra Levant? Oh, that's good. That's good. I'm not going to tell you that. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, um, so, no, I lost my train of thought. Okay. So, we, so it was a left right debate show, and the first night that the show was on, I'd never been, I mean, I'd been on TV as the president of NAC or as part of the pro-choice movement, but I'd never been like a host on TV. So the, the day after the first show was on, and I was going to a dinner party at Leo Panitch's house. I don't know who knows Leo Panitch, but anyway, he's a, he's a Marxist academic at York, and it was, you know, a dinner with all kinds of political people, including feminists and so on, and radicals, and you know, left-wing academics, and we sit down, and I said, so what do you think, you know, because I was nervous, right, like my first debate show, and they said, you look great. That's what oh. they said. You look great. And I said, oh, well, thanks, you know, but what do you think about what I said? Oh, nobody could remember what I said. And I swear to you that that was what it was for me working on TV all those years, and I'm not exactly, you know, a beauty queen, you know? So, I mean, I was never a beauty queen, and I certainly wasn't you know, 20 years ago. So, so there's something about television that's about image, right? It's about image. So I, I want to start out that way because I think it's complicated, right? Um, I was never put under pressure to look different than I look or anything like that on TV. But there was a way in which how I looked mattered more and more to me and to everybody else. And I don't think it was about sexism exactly. I don't know. I haven't really thought it through, so maybe that's something we could think about over the course of the evening. Okay, the other thing I think is that in terms of this film, I notice, I've talked to a number of people about it, there's a big age gap in reaction to the film. So I want to start out right from that point, which is women, and I think most of us are in the same generation here at the table, who went through the women's movement, and especially went through the women's movement at a time when we were fighting for representation of the media, well, most of us anyway had a pretty negative reaction to the film. And that was mainly, in my case, I'll just speak for myself because uh, others can speak for their self, mainly because she completely ignored the role of the women's movement in representation of women. Ignored both how hard we fought, except for I think there was a thing on the, on the Miss America pageant, and that's where, you know, feminism in the first feminist action in North America was protesting the Miss America pageant because we understood that the valuing of women for beauty alone was a serious issue for women. Um, but other than that, she doesn't really discuss at all the impact of the women's movement on women's representation in the media. And, that's, and that really bothered me. And then the second thing was that, um, and I, the second thing that really bothered me was no solutions whatsoever just like one thing after another after another of what's terrible with no solution. And the third thing is no recognition of what has to really change. And I can talk about that when we get into more of the discussion, how I see that. And of course it's American okay, <laughs> Canada's different, Quebec's different, and so on, but, but obviously I'm not judging it that way. Whereas young women who I've talked to, and not, and not just women in their 20s, but in their 30s and their 40s, who see it and who haven't been involved in the women's movement, for them it's a recognition of oppression, oppression that they feel. This is the, women's, the women I've talked about. So I'm going to change our original idea of what we're doing here. And at first we were going to have an hour, you know, the usual sort of thing where we have an hour in the front and then we go to the audience. I'm glad you all have mics because I think it will be much more useful if we have a more intergenerational dialogue on this and we have more um, questions and comments from the audience, and we and we have a, a discussion of the film. How many people have seen the film here? Okay, great. Okay, and we have a discussion of some of the issues in the film. So we'll start out. In particular, I'd like the panel to talk about uh, a couple of things, and then we'll go to you for questions and discussion. And we'll figure out. I'll figure out how much to stay in the audience and come back, and uh, when, when we get to that. So first, I want to introduce our panel, and then we'll begin. Okay. So, uh, and I, I actually know everybody on the panel, but I particularly know Anne and Francine very, very well. Um, not for 45 years, but. <laughs> so Anne, I know Anne because I know her family. She comes from a very, am I allowed to say? Very political family. She had two, two her two aunts are the fiercest feminists I ever met in my life. My aunts, I should say my aunts, 
did uh, the work of ushering people into the Morgan Toller Clinic. Yeah. When people were lobbing stuff at them and terrorizing right. them. Yeah, for right. example. And they also founded the Canadian Hemophilia Society. Right. Yeah. Joyce and Lois. Joyce and Lois Bedell. Dowson. Dowson, yes. Yes, and then Bedell. Okay. So that's how I met Anne, was through her aunts. <laughs> <laughs> I was the, what? I was a kid. <laughs> So, but, but of course, you all know Anne as an established figure in Montreal's media scene. She features a longtime host of CBC Radio Noon, and I think you had me on a guest a couple of times, or, yeah, and Home Run. She's also co-hosted the radio show Cross Country Checkup and As It Happens, and has produced both As It Happens and C'est La Vie. From 2009 to 2011, she hosted an afternoon talk show on CGAD in Montreal. Uh, she's perfectly bilingual and has been heralded as a hyphen between English and French Canada by la presse. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but okay. And has, <laughs> and has frequently guest starred in Francophone media, appearing as a juror on the Radio-Canada show Le Combat, they leave. In 2008, her career also transcended the scope of radio journalism into the political realm when she ran alongside new Democratic Party leader Jack Layton in that year's election. She doesn't have such good timing. <laughs> in front of this time. Oh, yeah, it depends. Oh, yeah, depends. Anne <laughs> um, uh, currently writes a weekly column for news and entertainment weekly website, Our, uh, Our Community. Our, Our Community. Our Community, uh, entitled Bloke Nation. She's also the Director General of the Tolerance Foundation, a nonprofit organization founded in 1995 to campaign against bullying and prejudice among students in Canadian schools. So long for me. Uh, Francine Pelche, I also know a long time, um, mostly because we both work at the CBC in Toronto at the same time, right? That's where we met, yeah. And uh, also, we, I think we talked during the, the aftermath of the Montreal, of the Polytechnic Montreal Massacre, yes. So Francine's career also spans a very broad range, uh, co-founding and acting as editor of the feminist monthly magazine La Vie en Rose, which was absolutely critical to the women's movement in Quebec from 1980 to 1987, to social and political commentary in a weekly column in Montreal's largest French daily in La Presse from 88 to 92, as well as on Peter Zosky's morning, uh, uh, morning side on, on CBC Radio from 88 to 91. Uh, CTV's Sunday Edition from 90 to 92, PBS The Editors from 90 to 92, and she spent five years from 1995 to 2000 as co-host of CBC's flagship current affairs program, The Fifth Estate. Since 2001, uh, uh, Francine has begun a new career as an independent documentary filmmaker and screenwriter. Her film credits include Public Enemy No. 1 on former Quebec Premier Jacques Parizeau, um, Sex, Truth, and Videotape, a six-part documentary series on women and sex, and The Last of the Wild Jews on writer Mordecai Richler, and Gordon Shepard uh, on the art, or the art of dying well on Montreal artist Gordon Shepard. And our third panelist, as, as you see what Mark said is true, that the, the experience in the media on this panel is incredible. Um, and our third panelist is Martine Vallée, who represents the CRTC, which is the presence and the activity of the CRTC is one of the reasons why the Canadian experience, women in the media, is different than the American experience. And Martine is part of the reason for that. She's Director of Social and Consumer Policy at the CRTC, Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunication Commission. She's responsible for the development of policy and regulation for a wide array of social and consumer issues in broadcasting and telecommunications. They include accessibility of persons with disabilities to broadcasting and telecommunication, industry self-regulation in broadcasting and telecommunication, industry codes on programming standards, the reflection and representation of ethnocultural diversity and people with disability in broadcasting, the portrayal of violence on television and advertising to children and alcohol advertising. That's a lot to be responsible for. Please welcome our panelists. Okay, so I, I guess I'll start with the question for starting from the film, and we're not going to restrict our discussion to the film, but we'll start with the film. The film suggests that the sexist representation of women is worse than it used to be. So my first question, maybe we'll just start with Anne and go across, is do you think that's true? 
I have uh, two young kids, 8 and 11, and I, I do find that the representation of women in the mass culture, for example, the films they watch, the programs they watch, is quite upsetting, and I'm constantly talking to them about it. Uh, so on the one hand, I'd say that there is real reason for concern, and we saw it clearly documented in the film, you know, scantily clad women. Like, I brought with me a copy of the latest Vanity Fair. It's a joke. It's really terrible, the, you know, the representation of really good actors and seriously bright women who are stripped down to their skivvies, you know. I, I, guess I find that quite upsetting. But I would say that in the generation of the news, the production of the news, the people who read the news, uh, there's been enormous progress. So I, I think it's often the case with women's history, there's progress and there's loss at the same time. It's sort of like a cyclical thing. It's not a linear progression. Uh, you know, for example, I'm going to leave a bit early tonight to go and be on a panel on the Tele Journal with Céline Gallipo, who I think is one of the critical people in television now in Canada. She's a, a fantastic anchor. She's a serious journalist. I have in, a huge amount of admiration for her. And behind her are a number of powerful women producers and reporters, or co collaborating with her, I should say. And as you work your way up inside Audio Canada, you see great not there are good numbers of women. There's seriously good representation up to almost the top ranks. There's never been a woman president of the CBC or Audio Canada. But I, I, my experience being inside the machine, like in the trenches, is that there's been enormous progress, and there are more and more women fronting the news. There's a, a lack of women commentators. Women tend to be really diffident when you call them and ask them if they want to go on the radio or on the TV. They often will say, well, actually, I know a better person. His number is, right? <laughs> so there's still a problem as far as that goes. But I would say at, at the same time as we're seeing women sexualized and hypersexualized, we're seeing progress in terms of the generation and the making, the actual making of the news, and especially of programs, television and radio, especially radio, in the public sector. And even on the private side, I see progress, although I am shocked by the incredibly misogynistic reactions to uh, controversial opinions. I, I have received really sexist comments from listeners at CJD. I was shocked to see how vicious the attacks on Christy Blatchford were on Twitter. Much as I dislike Blatchford's work, I thought the criticism leveled at her by men was unbelievably sexist. So at the same time as we're making inroads on several fronts, you seem to have lost ground on others. So that would be my initial response to that question. I think that I would sort of echo a lot, a lot of the things that you've said. I think it depends if you're saying, is the representation uh, of women and girls in the media, is it worse? I think it depends, is it worse since when? What's the time frame you're looking at? Um, is it worse since it was in the 1980s? No, it's a lot better. And that goes to what um, you were saying about the, um, the women's movement, the impact of the women's movement. There was a lot of pressure on the CRTC, on government. To, to do things, and um, I think there was, a, in Canada especially, there was a lot of strides made uh, for women in broadcasting. But I'm not sure whether it's better today than it was 10 years ago. I think that part of that might have to do with the increasing consolidation of the traditional media, and there are fewer media outlets and fewer avenues for, um, for, for, for different voices and, and um, a variety of portrayals of, of women. I think that it's better definitely in terms of how many women are um, are on screen or, or behind the, uh, the microphone and the radio. Um, you look at women, especially in roles that used to be traditionally male. I mean, you see a lot of, on television you have women sportscasters now, or you not have any, you have more women news anchors, um, your casters, that sort of thing. But you still have, it's not perfect, you still have a, issues about all the women sportscasters are drop-dead good-looking. Last time I checked, one of the men worked. It didn't, it didn't seem to matter. So I, I think it all depends, but I think that progress is, that is, is being made, but it, again, it's like a lot of the, these sorts of issues. It's often two steps forward, one step back. Um, I, I agree essentially with everything that's been said. Um, I think, you know, to say that it's worse today is to essentially deny that there was ever something called the feminist movement, so it, it's a little, that's much 
going way too far. I think probably the film would have been better if it had really focused on the hypersexualization of women. I think that is the issue. I think it, it, it's the issue for old and <laughs> older or younger women. That's what's really happening, and I think that's the thing we have to look at. Um, I, mostly, um, in terms of representation in, in, in the media, I agree with, with Anne and Martin that there's been great strides. Uh, I, I get the feeling that there, you know, when I, I just hit the media at the end of the 80s when I left La Vie en Rose, uh, I wanted to, you know, go out in the mainstream media and see if I could make it uh, with the best of them. And I felt, you know, I, I wondered if being a feminist, and not only a woman, but a feminist woman, would hold me back. And in fact, I realized quite the contrary, that at that point, uh, it was a plus. But come five years later, it had become a handicap to be a feminist, at least, not to be a woman. Um, so I think something stalled. I mean, if, if, um, if the progress that had begun in the late 70s and 80s had, had continued, I think we'd be way more women, not just on TV, um, but way more women even in the offices of power. And, and that's, that's where it gets a little disquieting, the fact that um, there are not women holding the, you know, the strings, uh, not just the purse strings, but calling the shots, and why women's stories are not um, as, that's one point, that's a good point that's made in the movie, why women's stories are not as interesting as men's stories. I know as a filmmaker uh, today that it's, you know, I think it's only 20% of women directors, even in Quebec, which is sort of the best place to be if you're going to be a woman in the media uh, in, Canada, in North America, um, it's still like 20% of women who get their stories across, uh, as opposed to 80% of men. So there's still, there's, I think we were still, there's a, there's a place where we're kind of stalled there. Um, I, I, and I don't think it's, it's a media conspiracy as, as the film seems to imply. Um, but um, so yeah, it's it's there are there are many problems, but for sure it's not all bad, you know. So it's like the NDP leadership. Violently <laughs> <laughs> agreeing with each other. <laughs> well, let me just take up this hypersexualization because you know one of the things that really bothered me about the film was that she showed the images of uh, women in the 40s, you know, uh, in film. Joan Crawford, Katharine Hepburn, Betty Davis, these very strong women. It was completely out of context, you know. In the 40s was when uh, it was in the interest of this, whatever we want to call the establishment to get women to realize that they could be actors in the world because they needed women to go into the factories and to do what men couldn't do during the war. So there was a whole, you know, Rosie, we've all seen the images of Rosie the Riveter. There was a whole effort to, uh, in the mainstream, to make, it was the only time Canada ever had a national child care program was during the Second World War, okay, to make, uh, to move women into productive work because men were at war, right? So there's no context to that. And then she sort of skips over Doris Day and Debbie Reynolds and everybody even know who these people are, you know, <laughs> all about, you know, la, 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 you know, happy housewife, all you need is love, not in the Beatles way, but, um, you know, like, all you need is Rock Hudson, by the way, it was gay, but anyway, and, uh, and, and all you need is a handsome guy to fall for you, and everybody's going to be happy, happily ever after, and then you'll be a good mother, and the father knows best, and all that, she skips over all that, which is like the 50s and the 60s, right? And, the, and so, yes, the sexualization is way worse now. But the images of women are much more diverse than they were. So, like, and, and this is something I, I, I want to go to the audience. I don't know if we can go back and forth. You can go back and forth on these questions. Yeah, I'd like to go to the audience about this because it, it, something of the experience of being young women in this situation where women are so, or if you want to, if you want to, yeah, so hypersexualized and also. Uh, needing to look a certain way in order to be attractive, right? Which is much worse now than it was when I was young, for example. It was bad enough when I was young, but it's way worse now. So, do you want to... Um, I, I just... Speak to that yeah. And that's I, what I think the film's about. I agree yeah, with you. Yeah. yeah. And I think the most <laughs> disturbing thing that's said in the film is, is said, I think, by Jackson Katz. He's said by a man. 
and he says that the more women have grabbed power, the more we are sexualizing them on screen as a way to hold them back. And I think that is uh, like an amazing, I mean, like a, 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 a very troubling statement. That unfortunately, yet again, you know, it's not, there's nothing to, to support that except the fact that you see a lot of sexy young women uh, on screen. Um, and I think that would merit a, a, a grand investigation. Uh, on the other hand, the one thing that is not said in the movie, and which I think is really important, and I don't think we've even really had the discussion uh, within the women's movement, is that we feminists, have participated in the hypersexualization of women. At least I would, I will, I will say I am guilty of this. Um, and I think I'm answering your question: Why this never, ne ne never, this was never your issue. It was never mine either. Except I, I remember that Bien Rose, we would have summer issues which would be uh, devoted to short stories. And in many, uh, many years, we would do erotic short stories. Sex explicit sexuality was something we wanted to explore. And we, know, we forget that our bodies ourselves is the first mantra of feminism. And that meant being proud of whole, bringing back, you know, uh, getting your, se uh, réapproprier son corps, and saying, this is mine. It's not yours, it's mine. And I can show it to you if, you if, if I want, but you don't touch it. And I think, uh, and because I did this sex series in, the, uh, in 2004, specifically because I was, you know, kind of amazed and troubled all at once by this, this image, this imagery that keeps coming of these, of women like more and more scantily clad and saying, what is that? Is that, is that feminism? Is that sort of liberation? Uh, you know, as opposed to the, the other dominant image of the time was women in burqas. So it's, you know, it's really the two dominant images of our times, being completely clad or completely naked. And on the naked side, it seems to say, you know, yeah, we, we, you know, we can do whatever we want. We fought for this, we can do it. And of course, I, I realize that it's probably a little more complicated than that, but I did see in young women this kind of, pr this na naive, uh, pride in being in and showing off their their boobs or whatever they had they they really thought this was cool you know it was they got Madonna's message you know like big time and and what they didn't realize is that society has not evolved enough for this not to cut for this not to have a price attached to it we interviewed men on the whole idea of women's hypersexualization, and for men, these women were slutty. For them, they were being strong and proud. So I think there's a part of this that is not, is definitely not just the media, it's part of what young women want, naively thinking that this is, this is a power that they can have as well as everything else. And where I think we're all in trouble is that the more they bring us these images of women, women, scantily clad, we're all sort of like buckling under the weight because obviously the body goes, you know, at one point. And so what are you left with? Um, so, so I think we have to acknowledge the part that comes with the times, you know, and that it is not all just macho stuff. And the other thing too is that the other thing that, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. The, the other sentence that really uh, got to me in the film was, Again, a man saying, women terrify us. What he doesn't say is women's bodies terrify us. Women's minds don't terrify us. Women's bodies terrify us. Which is why it is a it's a double-edged sword. It is not just objectification. I've always hated that word. There is a part of using a woman's body which is, it is powerful. And then there comes a point when it is a power that will play against you. And that is what is not clear anymore in, 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 in women's and, or people's heads. You know, which part is good and which part is bad. It's all mixed up. But it's definitely, we're not in the 50s, and we've, I think we've come way beyond that. I just want to, before I go to Anne, I just want to say that there's an article on the McGill Daily this week on this very topic of a young woman, is she here? 
Anyway, I thought she was very brave to write it. She went to, with her boyfriend, she went to a rugby, she went to a, 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 a party for rugby players. And she said, I like to dress sexy. I like to, so I dressed up and I dressed sexy and I wore my heels and so on. And I love the click of the heels and so on. And then she went to this party and the MC was making sexist jokes, really sexist jokes. And she was the only one who seemed to object to it. And then he said, then, you know, it was over and, and her boyfriend realized she was really uncomfortable and he said, oh, don't forget, the food's good, don't worry, the food's good, you know, just forget it, forget it. But then what happened was the MC said they had decided to have a prize for the hottest date, okay? And they picked, uh, and she was sort of, in her own mind, she goes through this, that she's, because she realizes that she's dressed pretty hot. And what's she going to say if it's her? Is she going to make a speech denouncing them, or isn't she? And she's playing this in her mind. And they pick a, a first-year uh, student and his date. And this young woman walks the whole length, and everybody's whistling at her and making cracks and so on and so forth. And they don't even give her the mic. They give the prize to her date. And she is silent. And th this woman who's writing the story said it made her sick. She felt sick. And no one objected, no one said anything. I said to my class, like, why didn't somebody, a man, stand up and say, this is sex as crap, you know? And we had a good discussion of it, but this is just what you're talking about, right? Where, and part of me says, well, why shouldn't she be able to dress like that? Why should, she, why should a woman dressing like that in, at McGill University be subject to that kind of, really, it's misogyny, right? Um, so it turned into a complete object without even a voice. So I think that's part of what we're talking about. I just, I would just mention that Nelson Peltier just wrote a really great piece on Huffington Post Quebec, the French edition of Huff Post that just started being published, and called Coeur de Pitoune, which is about the singer Coeur de Pirate, and how she posed in this incredibly ridiculous outfit, like needle stilettos and the whole deal. Like This woman actually is quite a talented performer. And Fonsette did a great job of treating that whole, sort of trying to play on both fronts and ultimately losing your identity in a certain way. Um, but I, I thought one of the quotes that jumped out at me in the film was this woman, Carolyn Heldman, I forget where she was from, but she said, women who are high self-objectifiers, women who have internalized this, this idea that you should be rake thin and, you know, a certain look, right? Um, they don't function in politics, they don't function in the public domain, they're, they don't run for office, they don't take risks, because they're afraid of being judged and found wanting. And I found that really upsetting as a parent and as a feminist. Because if you are going to emancipate yourself and take control of your life in, in as much as you can, as much as possible, you're going to take risks, you're going to fail, you may even make a fool of yourself. You have to do that to be a fully realized human being. And this codified idea about how women should appear is absolutely toxic. And, and she does a good job of making that point, I think. You know, even though she uses those Harry Potter things with those graphics and these endless factoids and statistics. But I, 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 I do think she's making a very key point there, right? You need to have agency in your life. You, you know, women and men, human beings need that. And I think that's where this whole thing about objectifying women and the, you know this addition of Vanity Fair, which I can't I come back to it, but you know on the one hand there's great content and good journalism, often by women, and on the first hundred pages is the most ridiculous object. Part of it is this thing about male advertising executives who are increasingly working their way into the mainstream media. By the way, the new big VP at Radio Canada is a former guy from Cosette Advertising. And somebody describes them as being m men with the sort of mentality of 12 to 25 year olds, right? So they're all they're thinking about is getting late, right? <laughs> so that's how they think women should look. Except that women you don't are. I think that's a somewhat ageist comment. Well, possibly. For men. Yes, but <laughs> I mean, since 25 I mean, is your outer. This is like a very. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, 15 to 18, all they're thinking about is getting late, but 25. Big so generalization. <laughs> Uh, obsessed with sex, I'd say. Um, and I, I think there is some truth to that. There's like a, an adolescent mindset that has become legit and in terms of representation of women. I think maybe that's what we're seeing. The other thing I wanted to open a small parenthesis on is that as a, as a woman who, died, who identified myself as a feminist from the beginning in the news business, 
I was always marginalized for that. Always. It was never an advantage. No. It was a big disadvantage. And you know, a person who sort of sided with, for example, the Mohawks when there was, you know, this aggressive plan to make a golf course out of their cemetery. I was called an Indian lover. There's a there's a very big conservative um, sort of chill in the media, even in the public broadcaster, I think. There's a very big concern about being sort of objective or not taking a position, which of course I would consider be, to be taking a position. Yeah. So I was constantly getting into tangles with various people like on the desk and, you know, even my colleagues and I was, you know, sort of baited for this stuff and I tried to stick up for some of these ideas because I thought my viewpoint was a legitimate one, a minority dissenting one maybe, but still legit. And I had endless hassles as a result of that and often taking a feminist position in the wake of the Polytechnic yeah. on the anniversary <coughs> when I would argue that it should be covered and that got me into a certain amount of trouble and conflict with some of the men on the desk. I think that's less the case now, interestingly. But part of that is because people are not consuming the media in the same way, and that's something the CRTC is up against. People are consuming television on their computers. They're not reading newspapers in the same way. There's a rise of the punditry and a decline yeah, in journalism. Let's, let's, let's get to that later. Okay? But that sex yeah. stuff, the it feminism it stuff and the all, sex yeah. stuff, I really found very upsetting. Yeah. And I thought she did a good job in the film. I, I would say that that was one of the strong elements of the film. I, I, want, I want to go to Martine because one of the, I think, weaknesses of the film is there's nothing about, well, what can we do about this? Right? Well, there were a few suggestions, right? Websites and stuff, but not really. Very, yeah. Nothing social. So I guess what I wanted to ask Martine to talk about is the CRTC did a lot about this in the 80s and 90s under the pressure from the feminist movement. So maybe you could talk about that a bit. I don't know if people are aware of it. Um, to know what we did do in the 80s in particular, in the, I guess the early 90s, to improve the representation of women and what the, how the CRTC as a policy body uh, dealt with that. Sure, I think that anybody here who's either lived through that time or has studied gender portrayal in the media um, probably knows some of this. But um, in the, and we keep referring to the feminist movement, which of course put pressure on, on um, government policy, the, uh, the government turned to, well, the CRTC also responds as a, as a regulatory body to, to public pressure. Um, but in addition to the public pressure from the public, the government also asked the commission at that time to look into the representation of women in broadcasting and to see what could be done to improve, to improve the representation. So, and this is one of the things, I guess, that sort of, even though, I mean, the film was focused on the states, which is very, the environment is, is very different than Canada um, with respect to regulation of the media. But in Canada, there, there was this, a lot of that activity that took place um, with respect to the, reg, the regulator and, and finding ways to improve the representation of women. Um, in, it, throughout the 1980s, the, the CRTC, and the major broadcasters became very involved in the issue. It was all sort of um, overseen by the commission. The commission had a task force and, and a few rounds of public hearings across Canada looking into the issue. The CBC, um, <clears throat> the Canadian Association of Broadcasters, who was the lobby group for the private broadcasters in Canada, and what was then the Canadian Advertising Foundation, which is now Advertising <coughs> Canada, they all made a lot of commitments to what they were going to do in the area um, the, of, of increasing representation of, of women in the media. Um, the CRTC also did um, two studies to look at the representation of the, how, how women were represented in different roles and, and in, different, um, yeah, in different roles in the media, were they represented on screen or not, and the roles in which they were represented in and then replicated that data a few years later to see if there had been any, any change. Um, another thing that, that came up during that time, probably closer to 1990, was the, uh, the um, establishment of what was then called Canadian Women in Radio and Television, Canadian Women in Radio and Television, CORT, uh, which has now evolved to be Canadian Women in Communications. And it's an organization, a not-for-profit organization, that is involved in, um, in mentoring women and trying to um, get women into um, higher profile roles in the broadcasting industry and, and the production industry. And now it's expanded to, to also be involved in other communications industries, telecommunications and advertising, and some other communications industries also. So uh, all that to say, 
there was a lot that was done at the time. Uh, probably one of the important things that was done too was the, um, the um, broadcasters at the request of the CRGC um, established guidelines on sexual <coughs> portrayal and sexual, I think they called it stereotyping at the time. And these were imposed as requirements that all, that all broadcasters adhere to. Um, the commission started looking at employment equity and on-air positions and um, was looking at, um, at broadcasters as they came up for renewals, asking them what they had done. So there was a lot of things that, that were done at that time. Um, since that time, it's the whole question of portrayal has really expanded and the focus has not been so much on women in, in broadcasting, but it's, it's on um, the representation of, and, um, and portrayal of ethnocultural minorities, Aboriginal peoples. And a few years later, we started looking at um, the representation of people with disabilities in the media, in the broadcast media, recognizing that there are other groups that, that are identified under the charter that are also um, um, receiving problematic uh, representation in the media. So that's really where the where the focus is now. It's um, <coughs> so that, anyway, that gives you a bit of a snapshot of the evolution. Okay, so we've got a few issues that we've talked about: hypersexualization what's changed, what hasn't changed, what the, what the film speaks to you about, um, and how, how important is the issue. So, anybody got any questions or comments you want to make? And we'll back to the panel. Yeah. Yeah, you have to press the button. And also, we are capable to respond in French, if you want to pose the question in French. There, there was a film several years back that was very powerful for me, and it was not a love story, which was talking about the, if you want, well, I don't know who's seen it, but a very powerful film that was able to go a little more profound in, and what I, what I saw today was like sound bites, a whole series, one after the other, of sound bites, and, and, and sort of a profound analysis was missing in there. But there was one thing that I, I, I would make a parallel with a film that's, that's come out uh, recently about birth, and it's called um, The Business of Being Born, which was made by a, a person in the media. And it got tons and tons of attention, <clears throat> and partly it's because it's, it's people who are in the media themselves who are beginning. It, it, she's like in the infancy. This film is a represent, representation for me. It's like her, ses premiers balbutiements de réflexion politique. So she's, she puts it out there, and because she has connections in the media, it gets a movie, and it gets out there, and, it, and but there are much more profound thinkers and filmmakers out there who just aren't getting the attention. So that's a little unfortunate, but then on the other hand, maybe because she's in the media, it's going to wake some people up. So it's a, it's a mix of the two. And there was only one other issue where you said that we're afraid of women's bodies. And I, I work in, um, I had the privilege of being on your show once <laughs> around the issues that I work on around childbirth. And I'm a childbirth advocate in Montreal here. And um, the, the, our bodies ourselves, you brought it up. And the whole movement that we had to try and take power over our bodies and recognize that our bodies are powerful. And I would say that 30 years after the, the humanization of childbirth movement in Quebec, what I see right now is that we're worse off. We've almost convinced ourselves we don't have the power to birth. We'd rather have the machines do it. We'd rather have technology. So we're in this kind of technology is God phase. And so I don't know if that's influencing how we see ourselves as well. You know, the, our capacity to be fully alive as women, you know. Okay, any other questions or comments that anybody wants to make? If you like the movie, that's good too. <laughs> I was going to say, I have a loud voice, I don't need the mic. But <laughs> no, it helps um, to hear. Yes, I had one comment I did, what the movie did highlight for me was how the politicians are treated. And I don't know if we get as much the same treatment here, but I find that does actually has affected me. I do watch a lot of American media, so even though I am Canadian, I listen to a lot of American media and watch the pundits and see how they treat these uh, these politicians. And it does not encourage women to become politicians or to go into the public uh, face 
and become a public person because, as you said, the first thing they ask you is how you look, and they don't really talk of you know it's all about is she wearing the I mean Michelle Obama right now they talk about she bought her dress at Walmart she bought her dress here then how did she do her hair what did she do this and that's what we hear about her all the time don't you know you forget that she went to law school that is she's done a lot of things in her own regard and um, so there is an issue that she does bring up about how uh, we the first thing a woman, when they look at a woman, is their bodies before anything above anything else. Yeah. And not when it comes to a male politician, their body is not the first thing that comes up, right? Yeah. The one it's a woman, it is her body first and foremost, and then the next. And that has so many repercussions uh, as a woman. Like one of the repercussions has to do with sexuality. And when you're very young and you're trying to deal with this, it takes you think that once you've let yourself I don't know, a male person uh, kiss you or touch you, then maybe they own your body and then they can go you know, to the next step. You don't really know, okay, like we were taught, yes, you have the right to say no, but it's still, there's still that confusing gray sexual area that happens, you know. Right, I guess. Okay, that's a good question to the panel is, what about the way the media treats women in politics. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that it's accurately portrayed in the film? And is it different in Canada and Quebec? Who wants to start? Well, I hope no I hope no one in Quebec said about Pauline Marois what some guy says in that film about Hillary Clinton every time she comes on TV, I I just want to cross my legs and you know, like um, almost Tucker that, Carlson. That was <laughs> Ça mérite des clair, you know? Um, um, so I, as I'm sure Pauline Marois would have lots to say about this. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sure Pauline Marois is getting a bit of a raw deal because um, she's a woman. That being said, you know, Pauline Marois, like Hillary Clinton, I mean, if I had been in the United States, I would have voted for Barack Obama. All women, feminist woman that I am, because I think he represented more than she did. I mean, he, there, there were two people who were representing, you know, oppressed minorities for so long, but he just trumped her minority. Like, he just came because of what he, everything he represented. So it's not, it's, that's what we mean about, like, you, you need a, a more profound analysis if you're going to do this kind of stuff, you know. It's true that it, women in politics are getting a raw deal and are getting not, and, and that's the best example of why, you know, girls, you shouldn't, you know, you should think twice before flaunting your body because it's always a way that they have of bringing you down a notch. And they do it for women politicians, you know. Um, as, and, and so th there's a sticky wicket there. And women should, should react. At the same time, it doesn't mean that they're not, they shouldn't be criticized as, you know, as political women but not through their bodies, you know, that's, that's the difference. I, I don't think, if I could just, I don't think the only problem is women being judged through their bodies. Like if you want to look at, let's say, Alexa McDonough, compare Alexa McDonough to Jack Layton and the way that those two people, they have very similar leadership style. They were both believe in a collegial leadership style. They both were very good team builders, right? And they're, they both have very similar personalities. And yet, in Jack Layton as a man, that was seen as a strength. In Alexa McDonough, it was seen as a weakness. And so I think it's not just that women are judged in their bodies. I mean, the only time I remember that, particularly in Canada, was with Kim Campbell when she got, she had a picture of her, she had a picture of her, where her shoulder was bare. Somebody took a photograph of her and her shoulder was bare. It was like on the front page of the page. You know, in the old days, yes. Oh, I tell, I'll tell this, the Flora McDonald story in a second. Um, and, and, but, but, you know, but I, don't, I haven't seen that in Canada, but women are judged by a different, women politicians are judged by a different standard. Mm -hmm. And the women who are taken seriously as politicians are women who act like men, like me. You know, I'm like Margaret that. Like I'm <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, yeah, the women who are very male in their, in the way that they present themselves, those are the women who are accepted uh, as leaders in the media. And women who are more uh, collegial, more, you know, softer, if you want, are ignored or are marginalized. And I think, to me, in Canada, that's been the bigger, the bigger issue. 
um, than sex than overt sexualization. You want me to tell the Florida McDonald's story? Well, I want to ask you about Anne Coulter and uh, uh, Sarah Palin. How do you how do they fit? They well, play up the feminine. yeah, they play they play up the feminine. Yeah, well, to me, I mean, I'm not, I've never supported anybody at, for a candidate because she was a woman, right? I never believed in that. You know, there was a time where Nancy Ruth asked me to join the Conservative Party to support her as a candidate. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I wouldn't join the Conservative Party if somebody, my life was at stake. You know? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I never believed in that. I never believed in that. Okay? So that's not the kind of feminist I've ever been. So that's so for me. I don't. I wouldn't care if Sarah Palin. I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't care if Sarah Palin. If Sarah Palin was was in herself every oppressed person on the face of the earth. I wouldn't vote for because her politics stink, right? <laughs> or I disagree with her politics. But the sexism in the way she was dealt with that's different. Like I thought, for example, the column that. Um, you know who's that columnist who works for the Star now and used to work for the CBC? Rex Murphy? No, no, a woman. A woman. Heather Malick. Huh? Rosie DeMille? Heather Malick. Heather Malick. The column that Heather Malick wrote attacking Sarah Palin was beyond the Palin, you know? It was beyond the Palin, but it was classist, not sex, more than sexist. It was classist. You know, so what about Flora? Of, okay, so the story about Flora is um, <laughs> Flora McDonald wore a pants. This is 1970. She was a, a conservative member of parliament. She's a fantastic feminist. So not, I'm not against all conservatives. And a red Tory. And a red Tory, yeah. So she wore a pantsuit to Parliament. And this was on the front page of every newspaper in the country, that she wore pants to Parliament, right? And anyway, Margaret Thatcher, what, before she was Prime Minister, she was just leader of the Tory party, she came to Canada. And that time, Mr. Stanfield, Robert Stanfield was Prime Minister, and he had a cocktail party. And he invited Flora McDonald to come to the cocktail. He invited uh, Margaret Thatcher to come. And of course, Flora came. She was a cabinet minister. And, uh, and Mrs. Stanfield, who Flora says in the story is very outspoken, said to Margaret Thatcher, oh, Mrs. Thatcher, I, I'd like to ask your opinion about something. She said, Ms. McDonald here, she wore a pantsuit to Parliament. And it was on the front page. It was a big discussion, the front page of every newspaper in the country. And everybody was denouncing her. And do you think it should be an issue of discussion that a woman wear a pantsuit? It was a very nice pantsuit, Flora said. It was made in Paris. She, and, 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 Mrs., and Mrs. Thatcher said, I would never wear a pantsuit to Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> said, well, you can't be sure who your friends are. She didn't quite know very much about Margaret Thatcher. Can I? Yeah. Is Flora McDonald the one who got women into the Broadcast Act? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But in terms of women in politics, I think it's in interesting what uh, Judy said, because I think I... I've thought that often that, you know, there was just one model of woman that could come into politics and it's la matron, you know, the, the, the asexual, uh, we're going to tell you how it's going to be done, boys. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I think that model is coming to an end. To wit, Sarah Palin, <coughs> Nathalie Normando, the politics is dying for a sexier model of women, but that has, like, has it all. And up, up till now, not too many women have had it all, that to please all aspects. It's a hell of a, 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 an order, it's a very tall order. But I think we are moving towards the complete package in politics. So perhaps she'll be, you know, an intelligent Sarah Palin who will be on the left, to will hope, you know. I have a comment on this. Actually, recently, uh, there was uh, one of the new NDPs, she was actually photoshopped in her picture to have reduced breasts. And it was in a very interesting article about a politician because when she did her parliamentary picture, she had a little cut white, white top and she had, you know, she was full breasted. She, I don't remember her name, but she's one of the, our members of parliament from BC. And they photoshopped her down. Really? She, yes, wow. they photoshopped her down because, so she doesn't look as sexy and to make her, and this about a year ago it was an interesting, okay. News and Jezebel. So this is happening that they obviously our government thinks that a woman can't actually be well endowed to be in parliament or she doesn't look serious. Huh? The NDP thinks that. Or the NDP. Or, well, or the whoever. You, you, right, 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 well, you saw that story about the woman who was asked to leave the house. The, yeah. Yeah. the woman who was asked to leave the, uh, the chamber, the House of Commons, because she had an infant, a three month old yeah. with her. 
Yeah. So yeah. clearly, and Sheila Cobbs did this a number of years ago, and it was a yeah. big deal, over 20 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's still a big deal if you're a woman who has a baby, and you bring a silent three-month-old into the house, you get asked to leave. But, but, women, yeah, in, but women politicians have told me here that, you know, once you were elected, you forget being have any kind of sexual attraction you know you it's your it was a, something you bargained you either take the p power with the men and you leave that power at home it was either or but i think that is changing and that's really interesting okay anything else yeah okay um about sarah Bailey. sorry thank you sarah Bailey. i think she played it a little mm -hmm. um Oh. <laughs> I think she's quite aware that she used her sexuality and her femininity to gain. For her, that was more important, to gain power. Uh, I don't think Canadians have that same problem. Hopefully not. I don't think we do yet. In terms of the film, um, it was a simplistic message to a certain extent, but it's, um, uh, it... Uh, you need to simplify the message if you want to get it to a wider audience. And she cannot go deep into analysis because that would be more for people who are more academically inclined or more into the field. I'd like this film to be seen by my sister who has a daughter. Uh, and I'd like to see, for my niece to see it when she's a little bit older. She's only nine now. Uh, you know, for them to become aware <coughs> of the objectification that society can impose. The other thing is, uh, to agree with Francine, about um, the, um, the, when we have, when we take freedom, there's a responsibility with that freedom. So exposing our bodies or dressing in a certain way, yes, it is a freedom for us, but we need to be aware of how others may take it and how they might use it. Okay, but this point that you're raising and Francine raised, it raises for me the slut walk. You know, and young this women are saying, no, yeah. you're wrong about that, right? Yes. Young women are saying, no, we should be able to dress however we want and, and not pay be, a price. and not pay a price for that. So, you, you, you had your hand up? Yeah. Um, I just want to make a comment about the movie. Um, what Francine said, I do agree that there is like a like kind of a pitting against the hypersexualized and then the woman who wants to be sex positive. But I feel like the movie didn't really touch on a lot of the issues of sex positivity and how that can be used to better or like to educate young women because it is right. Slut walk it was a very prominent um, kind of activist thing that was very recent. And I think it's very useful for people to find a middle ground between the two because of course yes we want to be able to control our bodies and not be judged for what we wear, but at the same time, I, I feel like most of the discussions about this middle ground are staying within the feminist movement and not being exposed or like um, proliferated towards the popular culture. It's either one or the other in the media, in my opinion. I think there's a, a couple of points that I think are important to make about the film. Uh, while I agree with a lot of the criticisms, criticisms you brought forward about the film, I still think there's a dearth of information or critique about these kinds of issues. So I think at least the film brings forth some of those ideas, and I think there's a need for that. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's positive. The other, and, and you know, when we look at films like th those of Michael Moore, which have many big holes in them, but yet they've still brought a lot of those issues to the fore. And I think that's been brought a positive good to society. Uh, the other thing I took a little umbrage with was when you said that there isn't much in the way of action. Um, it doesn't seem as much, and especially I'll, I'll join you in, 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 in the generational sense in that I'm more exposed to a lot of political action where a lot of feet hit the ground sort of thing. But I think the generation that she's appealing to here are, are a generation of texters and, and whatnot. And I think they did provide a few avenues uh, for people to reach out and to garner more information, but also to spread the word uh, using a lot of these media technologies. And I think also um, we have to look at some of the current movements that have been happening uh, 
take for example the Occupy movement, which itself was initiated by that kind of outreach through the electronic media. And I look at organizations like Avaz, who've had a tremendous impact around the world, and, and the whole movement in the Middle East, from actions that maybe for our generation, we wouldn't have seen them as being so <coughs> profound, but, but they can be. So in that sense, I think there is, although it's not uh, yet borne out, I think there's a potential for some action to come from. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> uh, is there, did I did I miss somebody over there? No. Okay. No. Okay. That's like I come to you. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, I actually like the movie. <laughs> um, okay. However, I think the movie there's something about an uh, underlying message about moving beyond sexual difference. First, it, what is promote? It promotes women becoming politicians, scholars. Uh, public figures, but become like affirmative themselves as human being, as like gen uh, in a like genderless fashion, as this like universal object of like uh, uh, politicians and public figures. And on the other hand, is also trying to move beyond the difference is in, in its critique as the problem that we have right now is not is simply mass media. The problem we have right now is history, for example. Yet, I think there's something like that they miss here, that there's something underlying all this thing, that they, at the end of the day, we have individual human beings who want to please, who, want, who live a lot to live, want to please, want to, to attract, and that's being, want, want to affirm themselves in the, their sexual identities. And I feel that point was missed in the movie, that at the end of the day, like for example, me, I want to be a man, and I want to affirm my sexuality, and I want to be attractive at the end of the day. And that's the miss in the whole story. Like, so it's a, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man. And I think there should be more talk about that. In the, yeah. And there's somebody in here. Yes, I just wanted to add um, or build on what uh, Cynthia you said, Hawkin. Um, you talked about uh, the possibility soon or potentiality to um, the, uh, to become a political woman uh, without necessarily having to act as a man or feel like you have to let leave the, your sexuality behind. Um, and but I also think that this myth of um, the you can do it all myth is something that wasn't touched upon in the movie, but that that I've encountered a lot in uh, young women of my generation that. Um, growing up with a feminist grandma, feminist mother, feminist aunt, um, I've been told, you know, you can do it all. You can get the job, have the family, you can be pretty, you can be athletic, you can be a great musician, but on a day-to-day -day basis, this is actually not possible in <laughs> 10 hours a day. So it's, it's a good thing to know that you can potentially do it all, but it's also very paralyzing to realize that you can't accomplish all of that in one day or in, in you know, in a lifetime extension. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to um, um, follow up on what the, the man at the front said about um, mm -hmm. uh, this this film reaching a lot of people. I mean, I think we could critique the film, it, you know, ad nauseum. It's a very easy film to critique, but if you go into any mainstream video store and go to the documentary section, I, I'm just scanning the, the shelves in my mind now. I can't think of a single like big mainstream film that takes on the issue of women in the media or women in general in documentaries like the Michael Moore movies and so on. So I think, um, you know, it is, I don't know what the panelists think, but I think, you know, you can talk about it as a film or you can talk about it in terms of its impact. Um, and I don't know if you want to address that, what you think about impact. I mean, you work in the media, how do you evaluate impact? Well, I would uh, just... Okay, can, can, can I... Take a couple. Okay, you want to you want to answer? react okay. to that? Yeah, okay. I think uh, what I've seen on the social media about this film is interesting. It's all over Facebook. It's tweeted all over the place. It's a big subject of conversation. It seems like the timing of it is extremely good. Like people are thinking, wait a minute. It's a bit like your discussion about second wave feminism. It's a discussion that needs to be had, and this film is a catalyst for it. And so I think you're right. It's playing a very useful role. Okay. There's somebody back there. Yeah. You had your hand up. Okay. Yeah. 
I guess what I found, so I, well, two things. About the, the what's been discussed in the last few minutes, like, I think this is a, like, an activist and feminist discussion that's go, obviously gone on for a long time. Like, well, if, if it's getting out to a lot of people, then it's inherently useful, and perhaps that's true. Um, but I also am, like, I question what the, the overarching message of the movie is, because it seems like a lot of it is based in, um, like, that like the the big goal for women as this big identity category should be attempting to access uh, like big institutions like uh, like mainstream politics or uh, the boards of certain international companies that themselves have been uh, oppressive or like PepsiCo for example has done, you know, isn't like a bastion of, uh, I guess, like what many of us would consider anti-oppressive, like anti-oppressive politics. And so, I'm not sure, like that the, that should be the main goal. I find a little bit problematic. Um, I just wanted to mention because we're talking about the impact. Can you use the mic? Um, it's probably my face. Um, we're talking about impact a lot. Well, we're, I don't think anybody <coughs> mentioned that the target audience for this film was high schoolers. And I think that's important because some of these issues of how she chose to edit the film, or how uh, this group of women chose to edit the film, how the, the sound bites idea. Um, you know, this could be very much related to the audience that she or the group of women are trying to target. You know, and as uh, you mentioned, you know, it was a very effective, I mean, it passed through the, the different trailers, because there were, there were two different ones, there was a shorter one and a longer one, um, were very, very popular on YouTube, they got enormous um, viewership. But if you look at the website, what they're trying to target is this specific audience. So how does that how does that change how we understand the film as this tool for change? You know, audience I think is key in that in that relationship and that discussion. Can I just add something to that? Because I brought my eleven year my eleven year old daughter tonight um, to this movie, and she absolutely loved it. You know, she was totally kind of fired up by it. So, um, you know, I think that's just... <laughs> uh, I wanted to add that also this weekend they had their hashtag, uh, there was the Super Bowl this weekend, and they had a social media com campaign, and the goal that they're trying to do is get these high school students or people to criticize the media, and they had a hashtag campaign where every time somebody saw something offensive or sexist, during the advertising campaign of the Super Bowl, they would hashtag it on Twitter. They said, I don't know how many, how many people participated. But this that film did that? Yeah, that was yeah. this weekend, this yeah. past weekend on okay. Sunday, and they had apparently a lot of people were tweeting and saying and you know commenting on when they saw offensive uh, uh, stuff on, during the Super Bowl and what they saw an offensive commentary, and they're criticizing live the offensive commentary that was happening during the Super Bowl or the advertising, and I don't know, I don't, there was like, I know it was in the thousands or hundred thousands of people tweeting, so. So let's, let's go back to the panel on the impact. Tom, did you want to speak to that? Like, it seems, if, if it's directed for high school kids, is it, you know, it was on Oprah, right? I think. Um, so it's, it's, you know, does it make it a better film? If you think of it in that way. Like that, it's oh. speaking to a you know group of people that don't know anything about feminism or sexism or haven't been part of this discussion. Well, as I told you before the panel, as a feminist, I applaud the film. As a journalist, I just kind of go. Mm. Um, as a filmmaker, as a filmmaker, but as a filmmaker, I bravo. You know, I know how difficult it is to get something going around that way. So unfortunately, it's. Uh, it, it, it's, it's often the simpler messages and the tweets that get out there before the documentary that took you five years to do and, and that might not interest everyone with the same kind of art. But, you know, I think if people get interested in this, young women get interested in this, then 
give her the Order of Canada or whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Did you want to come to the right thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have, have a problem with the movie. I felt it didn't cover everything, but it's, it's a bit different to make a, 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 difficult to make a film that's everything mm -hmm. to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I agree that, especially hearing what some of the people have said about the, the impact that it's had on the, the, the sort of younger generation, I think it is really encouraging. I think that the probably it's the older people amongst us that maybe are thinking more critically about, oh my God, all that we've done to <laughs> <laughs> recognize. Um, but um, you know, I, I think that it did the probably did the job it was supposed to do, especially if people are following up with those action items that they had at the end, things that, that you can do to address the issue. I thought, if anything, it tried to do too much, in fact. There was just everything in there, including the kitchen sink. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And also that fast cutting with all the tits and ass there, I wasn't too sure how that really worked. Like, I thought they were sort of exploiting and dissecting at the same time. I thought there was too much of it. Personally, watching it, I mean, I, I, it made me a bit uneasy as a viewer. Um, but I think that maybe somebody needs to make a Canadian version of that film. Because Canadian women's history is different from the American history. And women in Canada, partly because of the history of the country and the cultural context of the country, made faster progress on a lot of fronts than in the United States, where they still have not endorsed the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah. Women are recognized as equal in the Canadian Charter. American women never won that victory. They never won that fight. So there's a there's a whole you know there's a difference in the way that we've tackled some of these issues. We also have better regulatory uh, facilities. We, we ha arguably still have better regulatory uh, controls over what goes on. Uh, so I think somebody needs to make a similar film, but focus on Canadian her story at some point. Perhaps that would be. Okay. There women back <laughs> well, we tried, but we couldn't. There was a, the NFB worked with me to try and get a film. We couldn't get a broadcaster to buy it. Yeah. Oh. The there was a woman back there and her hand up. You had your hand up first. No, I thought you had your hand up. Somebody, a woman there over there had your hand up. No, I know he has his hand. Someone over there had their hand up before. No. Oh, okay. No, no, I was pointing. Oh, you, yeah, you. Me. And then the okay, yeah. just um, Well, I, I'm actually a high school. I kind of love it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a high school teacher of um, girls, actually, and I, I was educated in a girls' school. I currently teach in a girls' school, and I would like to say I think the film, at the end of the day, my first comment is that something is better than nothing because our kids are really not very reflective at all uh, with regards to how their women are being portrayed and um, the possibilities that exist for them. And what this film does have, because I do a lot of research into curriculum, uh, especially into school-based eating disorder prevention, and uh, it does have an entire curriculum on its website that is designed, uh, I do believe, from kindergarten through to grade 12 that can be incorporated with the film in schools. So I, I really do agree with the comments regarding uh, how the editing of the film uh, kind of is, is done in a sense that attracts that particular generation and the follow-up with the Twitter and the Facebook. And uh, if we put that into the schools, I think it had a really positive impact I'm sorry about this microphone, um, because the research for school-based eating disorder prevention, which I know is just one facet of the problem, does say that a comprehensive approach is the best way to go. Uh, and so if we can show the students and the teenagers in general that you know what starts in the classroom has an impact on society and has an impact on you as an individual, as a, a means of empowerment, is a great starting point, number one. My second question, to the panel that I'd like to address. I'm currently pushing to get women's studies into uh, my school, and I would love for it to get into all high schools, truthfully, but I think girls' schools have a particular responsibility. How do you think women's studies, or what is it, what is the tool that you would think would help us to get girls to be critical, and also to see, to kind of draw on what the gentleman to my left said earlier, that at the end of the day, it's true, we are all universal individuals, and if we could really avoid judgment of any kind and get people to acknowledge their power, that's the most powerful message as well. Um, just so, I don't know if you're aware that there's been a whole campaign in Ontario called the Miss G Project yeah. Yeah. that has actually succeeded over, I think, about five years of a campaign in getting women's studies curriculum 
-hmm. into the, the high schools in Ontario. Yeah, one of the writers wrote to me, and apparently the government didn't follow up with all of its promises, but okay. I, I know that they're very, yeah, okay. they made oh. progress. So I'd say to look at what they've done, because they really, they really worked on it for a long, long time. Yeah. Yes, now you. Yeah. Oh. No, there's, no, no, there's a, a man back there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was, it was more to respond Can you speak to, into a mic, please? Thank you. It was about the film, actually. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, despite some of its shortcomings, I thought one thing that was very beautiful about it was the way it ended. Um, unlike many shorts, uh, feminist shorts, or some articles that, that I've come across, it doesn't end in some sort of like crossed arms scandalous pose, but it, like, it ends with the uh, Gandhi's famous quote of uh, be the change you want to see in the world. And one very uh, motivational line that I found was from one of the coaches at the end. Uh, she just goes, be so damn good at what you do that uh, nobody will be able to stop you at it or something along the lines of that. Which I find is a good philosophy for girls just as well as boys, whoever. So I think that, that's what I thought was a beautiful part of the movie that okay. Uh, okay. I thought yeah, it was universal. Like, yeah. Um, I just had a question for the panel. There was something that I think Francine had um, brought up about um, how part of the women's movement was, you know, the the power to be able to show our bodies and and to embrace our femininity and not having to hide it. Um, but my question is, I mean, do you think that maybe the youth of today, you know, if you look at some of these these I guess pop stars um, and the way that they dress, do you think that they're still embracing that kind of? Is it the pride that they're trying to show, like feminism of, of embracing their bodies, or is it more of shock value or? You know, because you sometimes get the feeling that these women are dressing this way not because they're proud, but because they're trying to attract attention from the guys. And it's the males that are dictating, it's the, sorry, it's the men that are dictating, you know, the fashions and the, and the trends. So, like, what do you think is, like, how would you strike a balance, I guess, between the two extremes? Luckily, I'm not a pop star. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, like, I always think Madonna is a good example. You know, Madonna came on the scene uh, around the, uh, the, the height of the women's movement, and, and she seemed to me to be what I'm talking about. You know, our bodies, ourselves, you know, but s with sexuality all over the place. That was, that's what she is. That's what she, that's her brand and that's her thing. And it's, I think it's part of her affirmation of, of, of who she is and, and the kind of pop culture she's about. And, and I think she probably thinks of herself as a feminist. I don't know. We'd have to ask her. Um, then you, you have a whole. Then there's a whole ream of them, uh, which keep coming out. They keep churning them out. The Britney Spears and the Beyonces and the this. And the, I can't keep track. Um, and at one point, it's like, you know, oh, you know, like enough already. And it does. It feels a little mindless. And it feels like when you don't. You know, when in doubt flaunt what you've got, you know, rather than, this is, this is sexual power. And, you know, sexuality is a very complicated thing. And I think we have to remember that women's bodies and, you know, so watching that film, there was a lot of it. It is fantastic. You know, there's a reason why it's on the cover of Vanity Fair. It is extraordinary when it's extraordinary. You know, it really, really is extraordinary. So you have to, you have to embrace that too, but at the same time be conscious that there's a slippery slope right there, right in front of you. And part of it is that you, you're, you're going to lose that body. That you know, it's like my father who told me when I was six years old. You don't want to dance ballet. You won't be able to dance ballet when you're 86. You know. Unfortunately, when you're six years old, you don't care what you can do when you're 86. You know? um, I didn't listen to my father, but but he, you know, he had a point. <laughs> I think that your your comment or your question about um, young musicians, in particular, young women musicians, um, I don't think it has really anything to do, for the most part, with them owning their own bodies. I think it's all got to do with marketing, mm -hmm. and it's, there's an increasing, increasing pressure to, um, of that that in order to be a musician, it's not good enough anymore if you're a woman to be a good musician. You have to also be everything else and you have to look a certain way and you have to be, you know, slim and fit and dancing and, and everything. I think it's really got to do with marketing. And I think that's really a problem because there it's a barrier that's being put up.
towards people to be able to show their talent and be able and, and, and be and be known. Well, I don't know. I think that's true. I mean, I like Lady Gaga. I think Lady Gaga. <laughs> no, I do. I think she's done something different with that. I think she really has. I think she's exploring this whole other freaky side of sexuality and you know dress up and. I think she's making fun of the way in which women are forced to, uh, to, to, to present themselves. I really do. I think she's a brilliant satire of this. Um, at the same time as... The, what? There's always exceptions. exceptions. Yeah, but Lady Gaga is huge, right? <laughs> like, she's not some minor character. Like, Lady Gaga is like the it girl right now, right? So, maybe I'm behind the times, but I think she's pretty big. <laughs> so... So I think it's that's what I, I think it's contradictory, right? So like on one level, like I, I I hear what people are saying about this is making young women who don't you know who don't know about the issues and so on aware of a problem, and I, I you know I appreciate that. But on the other hand, I think it's much more contradictory than it's portrayed. Like for example, television. You know, The Good Wife, which is on um, network television, has three strong women. Two of whom, one of whom is older and very attractive, and not in a sort of young way, but in a way an older woman can be attractive. One of them sort of, you know, this star, and she's a strong, amazing character. And the other one, the only one who uses sexuality is a lesbian, right? And she uses it to manipulate men. Well, maybe you don't like that, but I mean, it's unusual. <laughs> so... And this is what this is a popular show. It's a prime time. It's on network TV. You know, this is a breakthrough to me. Or damages, which is about an older woman lawyer. And that's my concern, right? Like, you know, I, I don't want the film to be for me. There's a film for me. It's called Pink Ribbon. It's about the corporatization of the breast cancer yes. campaign. It's a very important <laughs> film that I really highly recommend. But it's like. I think it's more contradictory, so that's why I'm saying La Lady Gaga to me, I think, is way more feminist than Madonna ever was, and so, like, I, I think it's more contradictory than what is the way it's being portrayed, right? I think it really is. And then, well, we'll talk about social media. Did you want to? I'm just going to say I agree uh, that it's marketing and it's advertising driven. I mean, there are fewer viewers, fewer platforms. It's harder to make money. There is there are fewer owners of, of media outlets, so they use women. It's easy, right? And it's cheap, presumably, as well, to market your stuff on the back of a woman or a, you know, a sexy woman. So I, I agree with that. I think that's a big part of the problem. To the question about women's studies, that's something I actually know a little bit about, because I was the first research assistant at the University of Ottawa, where they're trying to get a joint women's study chair, women's studies chair between Carleton and Ottawa U. And it was a hell of a fight. I mean, we basically, the women in the various faculties just said, well, to hell with that. We're just going to call it women's studies. And you can take a class in sociology, you can take a class in history, you can take a class in religious studies. They created a women's studies program. Basically, sort of just arbitrarily, just took it upon themselves. And over time, just because they kept showing up, the faculty started to say, oh, well, these women are signing up for these classes, this looks interesting. So you just have to not give up on it. You just have to keep going up, just keep on doing it, and call it women's studies, and eventually, you know, the door will open. But that was what I watched the women at the University of Ottawa and Carleton do. And now there's like a chair, and Monique Bidet was that chairperson. It's like, it's a big draw now. People go and study that stuff at that school. Um, and I, I thought it was very touching what you said about the answer not being uh, necessarily to try and be it all. One person cannot be it all, right? The cute, athletic, smart, successful parent, that, you know. But we can be it all together as a group. Like that's where the solidarity aspect comes in, and that's where the food, the feet hitting the ground aspect comes. You know, it is quite possible that we may end up going on demonstrations again, fighting for a choice. It may be happening sooner than later, yeah. right? We're yeah. seeing this trial balloon going up in Ottawa. <coughs> you know, when does life commence? Well, I don't know. Every little sperm is sacred, I guess. <laughs> anyway, the point is, there's a solid, there's a, the, at the lack, of the problem I found with the film is that there is a lack of this political analysis, which is that the women's movement was an act of solidarity. A bunch of women said, okay, that is enough now. It started with Betty Friedan and Gloris, it started with Mary Wollstonecraft, it started with, at the dawn of time, probably, but, like, you know, that's what I think was missing from the film. Really, that would be my main criticism. The rest of it is just window dressing. There wasn't a real sense of collect the collective 
possibility we have as a group to go and make change. That's what women have done historically, and other groups as well, and that's what's really required. So, but to do that, you need consciousness, so the film is useful for that. But you don't have to be, though. You can have friends who do that other stuff. Now we're getting, quite a, we're getting quite a few people want to talk, so I'm going to get people who haven't spoken first before I take, if you've spoken before, I'll take you next, okay? Go ahead. <laughs> um, this is my work. Yeah. You got this, maybe you get a little closer to that. Yeah. Okay, does that work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think it's actually really interesting to look at like sexuality within women because I spent three months living in um, in the West Bank in Palestine, and I mean in the Middle East there's a completely different conception of women's sexuality. It's not about what you wear; it's about how you want to be res how you want to be respected, um, how you want men how you want to interact with men. You know, covering up, people cover up because they want to be respected for their minds. You know, um, and so I spent three months living there, you know, and at first I really missed my mini skirts and I really missed my tank tops. Um, and I didn't wear, you know, I, I wore sweaters almost the entire time. And when I came back, you know, one of the first things I did was I went out with my girlfriends and I went clubbing. You know, and I, I dressed up in my high heels, I dressed up in my really, really short, slinky dress. And then we get on the metro. Um, and all the men are staring at me. And, you know, back in the day, you know, when I was in university, I used to be like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, like, I'm hot. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. But this time it was different. This time, I felt ashamed. I was like, why am I masquerading myself for men's attention? Why am I dressing up like this? Why, why am I objectifying myself to get attention from men? And it hit me. It hit me that when I went clubbing, this was this... Was this um, reification of the objectification of women. No longer was I being objectified, but I was objectifying myself. And I think it's it's really important, it's so important to look at sexuality. And I think I think the question the question was asked earlier, you know, why shouldn't women be able to wear, you know, whatever they want? But that's not that's not the question. The, the question really is, you know, why are women being defined by the clothes they wear? Why are we still focusing on what women wear. I mean, men, a sexy man is not someone, it's not related to how much skin he shows. You know, if, if he's walking around with his junk hanging out, like, <laughs> that's considered unacceptable. It's not considered sexy. But for women, you take off your shirt and it's really <coughs> sexy. You know, it, it's, it's sexuality. I mean, I, I find we need to focus more we need to examine what is sexy. We need to take a critical look at what actually makes women sexy, and 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 find out how we can empower ourselves without without you know making sexy or or empowerment about clothes. Hi, I just had a comment about the the movie. I think it was interesting at first blush for people who are not maybe. Um, educated in the sense about the feminist movement and all this stuff, um, I think it was good, and especially like, you know, the, uh, the people in the audience that, uh, for the generation now. But also bringing the girls to watch, like, Lady here, she brought her, her daughter to watch the movie. I think we also have to bring our sons to watch this type of movie. I did bring my son to it. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I have a 19-year-old boy who is at first year in university, um, He's a feminist. He doesn't like to say it to his friends, obviously. <laughs> I'm a feminist, and uh, I brought him up, you know, being aware of all these, uh, all these issues. I think that it's important to, to bring into this topic the young males, because the, the, the movie was talking about all these young <coughs> advertisers, that, you know, they're between 25, 35, whatever it was. So these young kids, 14, 15, 16, 19, like my son now, they may go into advertising. So we have to bring to bring them into this and make them aware. This is what we're doing to women right now. So to make them aware and maybe understand that it's not right. This is not what life is all about. And once we bring maybe the boys into that, it could get more exposure because I think that now it's wonderful that all women, you know, we understand that this is wrong. It makes us feel uneasy when we watch certain, you know music videos on TV, you're there with, with whomever you are, it makes you feel a little bit uneasy because, you know, the girl is 
almost naked. So it makes you feel a little bit uneasy or not. But the boys, they're, they're not being educated about this. So if we don't educate our boys as well, then I think that we're not doing the complete job. Okay. Somebody back there had their hand up earlier. Yeah. There's been, you know, some talk here about collective action and that maybe it's missing. Um, I'm with an organization called Breast Cancer Action Montreal, and we also have a project for young women called Femme Toxic. And what that project is looking at, and it's directed by young women, it's about the representation and their use of cosmetics, and questioning why they have to feel so... Um, Can you move back from the mic a bit? Sure. <laughs> um, why they have to feel so compelled to use the cosmetics to, you know, have a certain kind of image that is acceptable and, um, you know, there's toxins in the cosmetics that they use and <coughs> at the age when most girls start using cosmetics and relying on them, that's at the age of puberty when they're most vulnerable to the toxins in the chemicals. And so it's an educational thing we do and we have a screening of this film coming up on March 8th for International Women's Day. And the idea is to meet together and screen the film <coughs> and then have a discussion like this after and talk about collective action and the strength in numbers and power and, and kind of figure out what is something we could do? Like what's one thing today that we could decide collectively that we would like to do? So if you'd like to come to that or if you want to tell your friends about it, it's on March 8th and it's at the D.B. Clark Cinema at Concordia. And uh, I'd welcome anybody um, to come along or check out the website, Femtoxic, and, and see about it. Femtoxic, okay, yeah. <coughs> no, no, this woman first, and then you. Um, hi there. I just have a comment, actually, about the movie. One thing that I do think it did well is um, educate women about the power that they have as consumers, or that we all have as consumers. For marketing to work, we have to buy it. And um, that was actually the hashtag um, campaign recently, is hashtag not buying it. And it's been huge. It's been huge, and it seems to have had a huge impact, especially on uh, companies like GoDaddy, which hosts um, websites. And there seems to be a lot of people who now have moved their website off of GoDaddy because of their advertising. So essentially speaking with your dollars, the power that you have as a consumer. Um, and also from this movie, um, if you go on the website, there are a lot of different things that you can do. So I think it's kind of like the movie is um, something to get young women more interested into this topic and they have a campaign for young women to upload YouTube videos, what type of women they want to see uh, represented. So anyway, I just wanted to say that, that I think, uh, I think that's one thing that they did do well, is that we all have you know, the power of where we spend our dollar. We have that choice. Hi, that's weird. Um, <laughs> Um, two confessions. Firstly, I didn't make it to see the movie today, so I apologize if my comment is at all redundant. No, that's so okay. You don't have to be said you didn't have to see the movie today. And I'll, I'll go see it at um, Femme Toxic. <laughs> um, but I'm just curious about, we've spoken about the way women have been manipulated by men or by these like media corporations and such, but um, what I'm kind of interested in is how young girls are socialized to treat each other and how they're socialized to act in groups together. And I was wondering if you guys could comment on that at all, the kind of bullying that happens between young women and how they're taught to compete like that. And I'm not sure if the film brings that up at all either. But <laughs> just saying. Uh, just a sec. Yeah. Okay, so do you want to, do you want to yeah. speak on that? Yeah, it does a bit. It talks a little bit about sort of the so-called cat fight, you know, the, the lack of solidarity between women and it being a constant, like women constantly pitted against each other for male attention. Um, and I, on the question of uh, bullying, though, that's something that I've actually come to work a little bit on with this foundation that I'm now involved in. This it's called the Tolerance Foundation, but it goes into schools. And, and the three forms of uh, bullying or exclusion that we're finding in the schools predominantly now are homophobia, is that constant, right? Like that is so gay, you know. C'est don't be like you see this kind of you hear this language all over the place. And on the one hand. 
there's been huge progress for LGBT people, and yet this language thing is like a reflection of a big malaise, right? So the kids marginalize uh, each other on that basis. The second most common form of bullying or intimidation we're finding in Quebec schools is Islamophobia of various kinds, like Taliban, Tamil, Muslim, Islam, it's all the same thing, it's a big messed up thing and people, kids' heads, they don't, they don't differentiate. So anybody who is from the Middle East or, you know, they all get thrown in the same bag. And the third thing is appearance-related bullying and intimidation, and that's where the girls get nailed. Because what we're finding is the girls have, and you see this in the film, they've internalized this model and they punish each other for not conforming to it and they punish themselves. They feel constantly inadequate and undermined by it. And I, you know, that that seems to be a real that's a real toxic soup for kid for kid all all kids, but especially the girls. And they 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 judge each other. Oh, I don't, I you know, oh, I like your hair. Oh, your hair looks funny, <laughs> right? And that's common, I think, amongst teenagers anyway. Like I remember somebody making a comment to me about a pair of shoes. I never wore those shoes again, right? Like you, peer pressure is huge, but it's got that extra edge to it now, I think. And actually, the film doesn't do too bad a job of talking a bit about that. Yes, I, I, uh, I have two things that you've mentioned that I want to comment on and you, you expand on. Uh, first was Anne, Anne Coulter. You just mentioned her name, but uh, she's a pretty aggressive, uh, successful woman that's, that's a lawyer that probably could go into politics, which she doesn't want to do, but she wants to write a book a month and sell them and become very rich. But she's there. Anyways, the most important thing I want you to talk about is poly, polytechnic. Polytechnic where 14 girls tragically got killed. I, I, I'm an engineer, and uh, at the movie, I remember when they were making the movie, they talked all about the fact that the girls were, were there, but at, they showed a picture of the of a girl who had died. She was in, obviously, she was graduating. She had an iron ring on her finger. Now, let me talk about that. She had what? An iron ring. It represented yeah. a graduating yeah. engineer in, yeah. in, the, in Canada. And I want to let you know the, the progress women have made in regarding numbers. When I graduated from McGill 50 years ago, there was only one girl in our class. Her name was Myrna Gertzowitz. She graduated electrical engineering, and she married, and the day after she graduated, she married a dentist. And we said, boy, is she ever successful. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the way it was in the 60s. Now, last year, I had the privilege of uh, sponsoring one of the people at the Iron Ring ceremony, the same ceremony, it's the last two and a half hours, it hasn't changed in years. <laughs> and there were, half the class, there was about 500 kids in there, uh, engineers graduating, getting their iron rank. Half of them were girls. Really? It's incredible. Like, I mean, from going from one when I graduated, and I was on the stage watching this. Now, there's a memorial outside here on McTavish Street. It's to the women, there's 14 girls that died. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so unkempt and, and, and poorly maintained. The concrete's broken. There's a tree growing behind it's bumping into the windows. You should see it's right across from the Union. Yeah. And I'm very disappointed that nobody's maintained that. In my project for my 50th anniversary, uh, I'm the class agent, so I every five years I, I organize a reunion for the engineers. My project is going to be uh, hopefully right. support people yeah. that we're going, to, we're, we're going to be putting up something very nice for the girls. And, and the engineer, I'll have to get approval of the engineering okay. faculty, obviously. Maybe Francine could talk a bit about Polytechnic and the impact that it had because you were mm -hmm. involved in numerous ways. Do you want to? <clears throat> well, that's a, that's a subject I need to talk about the kitchen sink. And, um, well, I. Uh, if you want to. Yeah. I've, I've always thought that, you know, <coughs> that event uh, signaled the end of victorious feminism, at least in Quebec. Uh, that as of that moment, it was okay to criticize, but not just criticize, tear up uh, the feminist movement and, of course, women by, by extension. And as of that moment, or soon afterwards, not only did you have the, the, the backlash, the male uh, backlash that be, became, uh, you know, Memphis, Nacelo, and all kinds of stuff, but it became a little testier. Um, to be a feminist, um, and probably the reason I had a better time of it is because I was a commentator. So they, at first, you know, it was okay to have a feminist point of view, but even as a commentator, at one point, uh, shortly after that, it was less and less okay. So I do think that even though this is one of our 
you know, uh, I think it, it remains a kind of taboo in, in Quebec society. It's the kind of thing that we just, we, we, it still makes us shudder and we, we like to think it was an exception that um, doesn't say anything about us, but I do think it does say a lot about us. And, and you know, that it also said that we were naive to think that such a big upheaval, the women's movement, would not have some kind of backlash to it. Mm -hmm. It was very different in English Canada. We we had this discussion before. In English Canada, we've been having a backlash against feminism since the 80s. Yeah, 1980s. Um, and what happened after what we call it the Montreal Massacre in English Canada, so we have a different name, um, is the opposite. That uh, suddenly the media became interested in violence against women, the issue of violence against women came to the forefront, there was much more government attention to violence against women, there was much more public attention, the issue of male violence in the family became central. That was part of the struggle that we waged, but it had the, op in a way it was the opposite effect of what it had in Quebec. And, uh, and so it, it's a really interesting thing about how those things work. We don't, this is a long discussion, we were part of a seminar about it um, at, at, at UQAM uh, last year. But anyway, um, I'm amazed that you have 50%. In English Canada, the opposite has happened. There was a rise for about 10 or 15 years of women in engineering, and now it's back to what it was prior to uh, Polytechnique. So we really lost ground in English Canada on women in engineering, and engineering schools are a real center of sexism again. Mm -hmm. um, and if you even raise, like I had engineering students who were males in a couple of my classes, and they said if you even raise the question, of representation of women, you get attacked uh, in engineering schools. So here, there's been progress, but in English Canada, the progress that was made right after is 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 gone back. So I'm going to take we're running out of low on time. I'm going to take one, or I'll take two more comments from the audience, and then we'll go back to the panel for some. Oh, you want to? Oh, you've got to go. Do you want to say something before you go? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, what I want to mention is, you said that Judy read it, right? Uh, yeah. That uh, Lady Gaga has a big impact on you. No, I didn't say, I just said I think she's great. She's great, like, okay, yeah. so she has an impact on you. Yeah. I just want to tell you, when I went to New York to visit my granddaughter, that she's not even five years old, she gave me a one-hour performance of all the songs of Lady Gaga. <laughs> she was dressed in a sexy way with high heels. Oh, yeah. Now, nowadays, the culture tends to uh, uh, treat young girls, even at this young age, as yeah. young, uh, as small women. Yeah. So what's your uh, opinion about all this? You know? Well, you know, I was saying to um, the panelists before that I went to get my four-year-old niece a birthday present, great niece, a birthday present, yesterday at a toy store, a big toy store. And I walked in and everything was pink. Everything was pink. Everything, even the sock puppets, puppets were pink. Mm. And I said, I want to buy a present for a four-year-old girl. I don't want pink. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this saleswoman was terrorized to find me something that wasn't pink. And I, you know, it seems trivial, but it's not trivial. Right? But like the they gender... should have been included in the film. Anyway, yeah, yeah. The gender, they... the gendering of children now is, I think, way worse, actually. That's one thing that's way worse than it ever was, you know, um, the way in which children are gendered. And in, and in child care, it's, it used to be, when we set up child care centers in the 70s, it was all about getting rid of, gen partly about getting rid of gender roles, and now it's the opposite. And so, not in all child care centers, of course, but it's really, uh, it's stunning to look at the way in which yet little children are gendered today. Um, and that's something I think we really have to, look at in a deeper way and it's something that the women's movement didn't do enough about like you know why is it the first thing you say to somebody is is it a boy or a girl right the first thing when you find out some, some somebody's had a baby you say is it a boy or a girl what does it matter if it's a boy or a girl it's like on one level what does it matter why is that the question even from us you know a feminist so i think it's something because i have um I'm with little people again, you know. Um, I'm really <laughs> thinking about it. Yeah, and my niece, my great niece, I have to say, she's like a powerhouse. She's a leader in daycare, right? She's a leader in daycare. And so the other parents say to my niece, 
can't you get her to stop wearing dresses? Because now all the girls want to wear dresses, right? Because she only wears dresses and tights, right? But she's a powerhouse, she's strong, but all she wants to be is a mummy and wear pink and be a ballerina, you know, it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little girl on YouTube who rants against pink, you go to see Yeah, okay, yeah, I saw that, I saw that, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, oh, we've got lots of stuff, and we, we don't have time for everybody to, uh, I, I said I'd take you, I can't take you guys, yeah, go ahead. We have to be out of here at nine? We have to end at nine, yeah. So I'll take you, but I can't take you too, go ahead. Hi, let's go back. Sorry. We can't hear you. Can you, you need to move over again. Maybe move over to the next mic. Okay. I'd like to go back to what Trish over there said about actually doing something. And by the way, you should know that Trish is the person who started Pink Ribbons. Uh, that, that film that you mentioned. She didn't take credit for it. Oh yeah? She Great. started that film. Congratulations. <laughs> so, um, Great film. Um, I would like to encourage every female athlete here, anyone who partakes in sports, who ever opens up any magazine that has to do with sports, to take note of how many times you see a female, um, a female athlete who is the, the, at the top of her game, instead of being, instead of the picture being of her in her athletic prowess, it is a picture of her in some sort of sexy pose with half her clothes on. And I know I write for Steve. I write for Steve. <laughs> I'll just shout. You're too radical. I don't know what to do. That's it. You yeah. turned off your mic. You're too radical. I'll just shout. I, I, for instance, write for, use the right for Ski Racing Canada magazine. And what drives me crazy is, for instance, at the same moment that Jennifer Heil became the greatest skier ever in the history of the sport, the magazine ran a contest of who would you like to see on the cover, and it included three males. Needless to say, Jennifer Heil wasn't included. So I said something to them like, if Jennifer Heil were a man, and she had become, and he was the greatest skier ever in the history of the sport, you wouldn't have this contest. And their response to me was, Oh, but we gave Jennifer Heil a double page spread inside. Now, of course, that double page spread is only from her neck up. I think in the whole history of like every sphere, whether it's this month with Ashley McCarver, who's the greatest um, female uh, sphere cross ever, you know, she's on a snowmobile with this, oh, come get me look, right? <laughs> She's not skiing, she's half naked, in the middle of the snow, by the way. Like, it is, there are no pictures of women being athletes in this magazine. Okay. And my, my two So your cents, action point you said you had? My, my action point is, every time you see this, write them a letter. Send them okay. an email. Say, WTF, can you show up with an athlete being an athlete? Right. Okay, great. Great suggestion. Okay, so thank you very much. And do you want to, any closing comments? Uh, well, I'm, I'm just glad to see that uh, what's happening around this film. And I totally agree with what you just said. Um, I think we've been a little too complacent uh, for the part of the reasons I explained, you know. Um, but I think every time you've had enough, speak up. Speak up. <laughs> I'd just like to say that I'm really impressed by all the energy and enthusiasm in the room. Uplifting to hear it. You keep doing your good work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to, on your behalf, thank, thank the panelists very much. Thank the organizers who did a lot of work. And, uh, and thank the, I'm going to say it all wrong, so Media at McGill and the WIT, because they never call things like just ordinary, like media studies or communications or women's studies. So what's the women's studies called here? I don't know. What's it called? Oh, yeah, whatever. Okay. And thank you all for a really great discussion. Please join us for the reception.